Well, good afternoon and welcome th from 39 Ethics Chambers to episode six of 39 from 39. Uh, for those less familiar, this is a form of webinar in which within an hour and giving each of our speakers 30 minutes or thereabouts to make their presentations, we try and share with you a particular topic of relevance at the present time and no more so this afternoon than planning and viability as we look at the proposed government's reforms in the context of where we stand at the moment in terms of delivery and deliverability. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce the panel this afternoon. Um, we have um, two uh, particular additions um, to the usual lineup because uh, this afternoon I'm delighted to welcome Matt Spilsbury, the, the Head of Development Viability at Turley, uh, and also uh, inviting back Richard Harwood as well. Uh, Catherine, uh, a number of you have met previously, and thank you so much, all of you, for joining me this afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, Juan Lopez, who was scheduled to speak, um, has got um, overwhelmed with a particular piece of work at the moment, and Richard's very kindly stepped in. But since Richard was involved in Hoban Studios, we will get two perspectives this afternoon, uh, that from Catherine, but also uh, from Richard as well. Um, three other matters I just want to mention before we get underway. The first is that there is a Q&A facility and we will try and answer your questions. If we don't manage to reach them, uh, then do please uh, feel able to email um, either through marketing or through our practice team as well. Uh, secondly, there will be um, a recording made of this particular webinar. The slides will also be available as well, and those will be um, emailed to you or available from our website uh, later on in the week, where thirdly, you will find um, some very useful material from previous webinars and indeed our podcast series as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Matt this afternoon who's going to be talking about the <clears throat> outworking of the requirements of uh, national guidance and advice, as well as the current uh, RICS professional guidance and statements. Uh, that'll be followed by Catherine talking about Hoban Studios and then Richard about testing viability arguments, giving some examples with which he's been involved. So Matt, over to you. Thank you very much, John, and good afternoon, everybody. So uh, firstly, um, I think it's important that we consider the economic context. Where are we now? The viability of development is intrinsically linked to the wider economy, which drives property market conditions. So what is that context? Well, it's relatively unprecedented, certainly in my professional life, and I imagine in, in the case of others as well. So what's happened in the past 12 months? Where are we now? Well, the Bank of England Monetary Policy Report for February 2021 provides near-term forecasting. GDP, UK GDP in 2021 quarter one is expected to actually be below 12% below its Q4 2019 level as a result of the lockdown measures we've experienced. Looking to the graphs on the right-hand side, as you can see, unemployment and inflation are expected to increase over coming months. So these are important near-term considerations because employment rates drive consumption, which influence residential and commercial occupier demand and pricing. Inflation drives growth in development costs and finance costs via interest rates. And obviously the stop stop impact of COVID-19 will impact on the delivery and construction programs of specific schemes, which can in increase cost and risk. So cumulatively, all these factors do actually drive development risk and investment risk which will influence target returns through development. Next slide, please. So moving forward then, what's the, the, the economic context, the outlook? Well, again, turning to the, uh, the Bank of England's forecasting, um, the picture is actually one of cautious optimism, which, which is a positive. So GDP is expected to return to pre-COVID-19 levels by Q4 2021. There's then strong growth in GDP of 7.25% forecast in 2022, which then levels off in 2023, and a return closer to the long-term trend 
at 1.25 per cent per annum in fact slight, slightly below the longer term trend so subdued this year but positive strong year projected next year so next slide please so what does that mean then what's the implications for the various property sectors um, so I've, I've tried to give a relatively quick skim through here so apologies if i'm not covering everything so starting with residential, well, the residential market actually has been the biggest surprise of the past 12 months, completely contrary to, to the wider economic context. It's not only been resilient, but it's actually been strengthening in general, albeit not across all markets. So in particular, central London, city and town centre flattered development, uh, other urban locations have faced decreasing demand and price pressures, rental pressures. Transactional volumes in 2020 and 2021 do, however, remain robust. And Halifax has actually reported a 5.2% year-on-year price increase in February, while nation nationwide has actually reported a 6.9% rise. So both of those rates well above respective five-year averages, which is 4% for Halifax, 2.8% for nationwide. So very strong um, overall, driven predominantly by this race for space that we've seen and a, and a suburbanization, ruralization um, out, of, out of town and city centres. So some forecasters remain quite optimistic for price growth. I've seen, seen various houses forecasting for the next five years quite strongly. Others are more cautious. Um, I think it's important to remember the resi market's been buoyed by government subsidy, the form of job retention scheme, mortgage payment holidays, SDLT relief and, and the extension of help to buy, as well as the government backing of 95% mortgages. So the market's going to be highly sensitive to being weaned off fiscal stimulus over the next 12 months or so. Is the current boom a false economy? Well, I, I've not got a crystal ball, so I'm not sure, but everyone will no doubt make up their own minds. A couple of sectoral specific areas. So the bill to rent sector, occupancy rates remained relatively stable, rent collections didn't suffer like in some other sectors, investment activity was slow um, over the majority of, of the last year, but has actually recommenced. Um, and interestingly, investor appeal um, has increased in respect of co-living development, which is, which is emerging as a sector in its own right. PBSA, um, so purpose-built student accommodation, has faced quite significant occupational challenges, which are well known, um, but is expected to return um, over the course of the next 12 months or so and attract investment and new development um, in prime locations. Turning to offices, um, well, offices have been quite hard hit. Headline rents at the moment have held fairly firm in, prim in primary centres, but there's been increased incentives that we've seen. So rent-free periods, fit-outs, uh, fi financing for tenants. Um, but overall, transactions, so lease transactions down about a third over last year versus the 10 year average um, and average capital values reported to have, have decreased by about three to five percent in terms of the, the overall value of those assets. Um, and in terms of investment transactional activity, 50 to 60 percent down last year on traditional um, traditional averages. So it's an interesting market. Overall, it's been held in suspended animation. So um, it will be interesting to see what happens regarding occupier decisions around space requirements, locational factors. All that is to come and is very much dependent on vaccination rollout. So it could be quite a, a, a difficult period um, in respect of the office market. Retail hit very hard, particularly high street retail. There's, there's a real structural shift I think we've seen. We're not really expecting to go back to where we were before. There was already a trend, it's been accelerated. There's a high level of void, insolvencies happening. And I think the, the shift's going to be a move to shorter, more flexible lease term, terms and turnover leases as well. Those will impact on capital values negatively, particularly in the short term. From a development focus, I think it's going to be on asset repositioning. So for mixed use diversification in particular, for example, um, the picture you've, you've got there on, on the slide is uh, Hammerson's redevelopment of the Debenham store at High Cross in Leicester, which is a joint venture uh, with Package Living for 300 built to rent units and is a very good example of this type of repurposing activity. I think it's going to be more challenging in secondary locations. So there's likely to be a reliance on public sector funding to redefine those retail centres. The examples are the high streets funding that we're seeing through the levelling up agenda, 
and then welcome back funding of which was quite a small amount but 56 million announced at the weekend logistics uh i'm not going to say too much about logistics it had a stellar performance in response to covid 19 in, in over the last 12 months take up rates almost doubled year on year in 2020 and there's expected rental growth of say two to three percent per annum going forward as well as yield compression which will drive capital values um, in good quality well located um, places so they're not there's not likely to be a significant viability challenge in respect of of logistics development. Finally, leisure and hospitality, again, hit very hard, particularly the hotel market. So occupancy levels very much curtailed due to COVID-19. There's gonna be very fierce competition expected for visitors upon reopening. Um, occupancy rates are critical for um, operational profitability under the, the hotels model. Um, and it will be a, a, a fight for the, a, a, I think, for the fittest, survival of the fittest, really. Um, consensus forecasting that I've seen is that assuming vaccination rollout is successful over 2021, domestic and international occupancy rates in the hotel sector is expected to recover by about 2024. So UK market hopefully back to where it was previously by that point in time. That's quite, quite a long period of recovery. Um, pubs, bars, restaurants and other leisure venues face the strongest headwinds, in my opinion, um, but there are prospects for revival if we see a good result as a result of vaccination and a, a, a removal of the restrictions that are in place at the moment. But again, it's going to be tough, I think, over the summer and we're likely to see, I think, um, particularly in, in secondary locations and where there might be an oversupply of these uses, repurposing again of sites. Um, for example, you know, a shift towards residential conversion. Next slide, please. So that was a very quick canter through where things, where things are at the moment, just my own opinion and, and taking some forecasts and, and, and evidence. Um, so I think it's fair to say that there's, we're in a, a very significant period of market instability, volatility. There are still very evident risks across multiple sectors. And I think that's quite important consideration in, in viability and important in plan making and also site specific decisions around uh, applications where viability is, is likely to be an issue. I think it's probably going to be of increasing importance going forwards. Therefore, it's very necessary that there's a robust evidence base in place. And we'll come on to that shortly. I think worth just stepping back and reflecting on what viability in the planning system is, is there for. So PPG states it's to secure maximum benefits in the public interest through the granting of planning permission. But that must be a balancing act. So plans must be deliverable, policies must be realistic and achievable, and there must be flexibility built into the system to allow for the kind of shocks that we may see through economic volatility, through um, outside factors, unforeseen circumstances. And really that's what viability is there for. It's a, it's a release valve to avoid site stalling. Next slide, please. So what's there to guide us? What standards are in place? What guidance, legislation? Well, it's important to reflect that there is a robust and significant framework in place. And I've, I've put a little diagram there, which is prepared by the RICS on the right hand side of the, the slide you can see. Obviously the framework starts with the legislation, but there is then national planning policy framework. In practice, that's borne out through the planning practice guidance on viability, which is, is a sort of a handbook for practitioners. But the RICS has also stepped up and they've produced um, very recently a set of mandatory professional standards which chartered members must adhere to. That's consistent with the NPPF and PPG. And that's in the RICS professional statement. It's called Financial Viability in Planning, Conduct and Reporting First Edition. It was actually, I say it was recently, time has flown. That was actually May 2019. Um, and that sets out 14 specific requirements that RICS practitioners undertaking and producing viability assessments for planning purposes must follow. I would say it's essential reading for any stakeholders in the sector and represents the barometer against which all assessments must be measured um, through the the process, the local plan process, but also in, in decision taking and appeals and such forth. We're also expecting an updated um, full financial viability and planning guidance document, which was consulted upon last year. 
I think given the current context, it's gone relatively quiet on that. I think it's being reviewed at present following the responses to that consultation. Next slide, please. So what are the key issues in practice? I'm not going into wholesale technical detail here, but there's obviously room for and, and time for questions at the end of the session. Um, and I know some of my fellow speakers will be going into some further details on, on these matters. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask those. So I think it's plain to see there's an evolving context and that's going to present challenges, I think, in setting deliverable local plan policies and still charging costs. I think there's also regulatory changes and, and a, which represent additional burden to development in the form of costs which need to be recognised. So it, it is a moving, a, a moving context, shifting sands. So, for example, two of those briefly are um, firstly the amendments to the Community Infrastructure Levy Regulations 2010 introduced in September 2019. Well, these removed the polling restrictions on Section 106 obligations to allow both SIL and Section 106 obligations to fund the same items of infrastructure. This has actually resulted in some cases in both Section 106 costs and SIL being, being charged on development. So additional costs such as highways, education and healthcare, which have added an additional cost burden that needs to be considered and reflected in viability assessments. And then more recently, the government published in January 2021 its response to the consultation on building regulation Part L and the future home standard. So they, they've effectively specified that the option that they will take forward will result or requires a 31% reduction in, in house emissions. Um, the cost of that is going to effectively equate to an additional circuit. It's about, based on the government's advice, about two and a half thousand pound per per flat and about £3,100 per house. At the moment, these costs aren't going to be reflected in current building cost indices and therefore will need to be taken into account. So just a couple of areas to show where there's going to be increased costs. We also saw the tax uh, announcement yesterday for a residential developer tax, um, which will effectively support um, funding towards cladding coming in in circa 2022, so another cost. A couple of areas that I'll just touch on then also that are also very relevant is the valuation process. So it, it is a detailed process in undertaking a viability assessment. The government leans towards and encourages a standardisation of that, but it's not possible in, in, in every element of that assessment. And there will still be room for professional opinion and disagreement um, and challenge. A couple of areas that are very pertinent at the moment are, of course, achievable current market values. We should base it in the current market realistic current market construction costs. There's a lot of volatility in both of those and, and uh, there's some extenuating circumstances which must be considered. So undertaking a robust assessment and process in determining those two particular areas is important. Benchmark land value, another very big issue, which uh, is, is one that continues to face um, challenges on, on a regular basis. So that's the calculation of of effectively what a reasonable return to the landowner is in, in, for the site in question. Um, and then the level of that should factor in a level of premium as well. So usually based on, well now based on existing use value plus a, um, an uplift or premium. Then finally, um, the risk adjusted market return for a scheme. Now there's a higher risk profile that we're sat in at the moment. And as a result, that's having an impact on, on expected returns as well, required returns. So those factors aren't fixed, they're moving. Finally, then, the system. So I think it's important that there's increasing transparency. There's a, a building of stakeholder trust through the system at the moment. I feel it's this is an area of planning which perhaps has been sort of less trust in than, than, than it should be. Um, and the, the shift to the, of the ICS to increase the level of regulation through professional standards that has been introduced is very important in that respect. You know, all surveyors must be held to account when undertaking this type of work. And I think it's therefore important that those undertaking this work are ICS regulated. That should give confidence to all in the process. Finally, implications on timescale for decision-making, that, that is a big issue. So. At the moment, it, it can be perceived and it does in some cases slow down the process if running a viability assessment through the application uh, process. I think there's room to increase capacity both in local authority and then also in those that, that review this type of work for, for local authorities. 
and and also there's there's a need to probably increase skills um, both within local the local authority themselves, but then potentially also through uh, elected members as well to, to help them understand this process. Next slide, please. So very briefly, just some concluding thoughts there. I think it's fair to say we're in a period of very significant property market instability. There's going to be fluctuation in the, new, in the near term. There's probably likely to be more volatility as we see fiscal stimulus being removed slowly and, and the UK economy being weaned off that. There's also the potential downside risks that we may see of a further wave of COVID, for example, or increased unemployment. It, it's all yet to be seen. So in that backdrop, development viability is expected, I think, in the short to medium term to actually increase in importance and relevance. It, it needs to be there, it needs to be robust to support and inform deliverable and realistic local plans against particularly this backdrop of increasing costs and risks to development. And it's there to form that release valve to avoid development stalling, plans stalling as well. But clearly there are challenges that remain capacity, consistency and trust in the system, transparency, it's very essential that transparency is increased, but it's an inherently complex process. Uh, there, there needs to be evaluation process that's followed, the RICS guidance and, and professional standards are there to support practitioners in that respect and stakeholders should be aware of that. Um, and ultimately it is evaluation and, and viability assessment process and it can't fully be standardised or removed. There will always be site specific issues that need to be considered. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to pick up there by talking about the Hoban Studios case. Um, now, of course, we have got Richard Harwood here now too, who, who is the true Hoban Studios expert, having acted for the successful claimant in that matter. So what we thought we'd do is that I'll set out in basic terms the background to the case, what was decided, and some, um, some lessons learned, if you like. And then Richard will pick that up and add some of his insights, um, obviously being particularly knowledgeable about the case. Uh, and then, of course, um, I suspect people will have lots of questions on this matter, so we'll both be around to answer them for you. Um, so just to um, set the scene, as it were, the claimant in this judicial review was Hoban Studios, and they are the leaseholder and operator of one of the largest photographic studios in the world um, in Hackney. And you can see I've put a photograph there of um, their premises from, from one angle, from the canal side. Um, and essentially, the interested party, who I assume was their freeholder, has or had and has, I presume, aspirations to redevelop the site um, for residential and commercial redevelopment. Um, so what happened first of all in round one of the litigation, a planning permission was granted in 2016 and it was successfully challenged by the tenants uh, Hoban Studios effectively on the basis that there hadn't been a consultation on amendments to the scheme. So that was round one and the first planning permission was quashed. Um, and that's really where our part of the story begins then with the second application that was made. Um, and importantly for our purposes today, as part of that second application for planning permission, the applicant offered just over three quarters of a million pounds towards off-site affordable housing. And that was not what policy required um, in the usual way for lots of boroughs in, in London. The expectation in policy is for on-site affordable housing, um, unless there are exceptional circumstances. So what the applicant did was to put forward expert viability evidence to try to um, establish that providing on-site affordable housing was unviable. And so it was justified in paying this sum of money as a contribution towards um, off-site affordable housing. Um, next slide, please. 
So there were two iterations of the viability assessments. The first assessment was published for members of the public to see, but um, the numbers were redacted. And the second version, the uh, assessment as a whole wasn't published, but a summary of that assessment was. So the claimants, Hoban Studios, asked the council to publish the most recent assessment in full so that they could consider it understand the basis on which this um, policy in compliant affordable housing offer was being made and then make representations on it if it was appropriate in light of the evidence base. Um, but to no avail, the full assessment was never um, published and indeed the council went on to grant the planning permission um, and that was in 2019. Uh, and amongst other map from amongst other grounds amongst other reasons it was challenged by the claimant on the basis um of the limited and incoherent um viability uh, evidence uh, and indeed the failure to to publish it um in full and that claim succeeded so that's that's the background I want to now look at the legal framework. So if I could have my next slide, please. The key, uh, the key um, statutory provision that we need to look at is section 100D of the Local Government Act, which is concerned with the inspection of background papers. And in a nutshell, where a report is required for a council meeting, so here we're talking about an officer's planning report, there is also a requirement under this section for a list of the background papers uh, referred to in that report to be, um, well, to be provided in a list and then for a copy to be made available of those documents for the public. Um, and you can see there towards the bottom of the slide, sorry, the formatting's um, gone a bit strange, but effectively the definition of background papers are those documents relating to the subject matter of the report which disclose any facts or matters um, um, which on which in the opinion of the officer the report um, or an important part of the report is based and have in his opinion been relied on to a material extent in providing the report. So to paraphrase very crudely, if the background papers are, um, sorry, can we go back to the previous slide? I haven't quite finished. If the background papers are um, material, if they're important to the issues being looked at and decided in the report, um, then you're going to come within the terms of this section. But there is an important exception and that's subsection four there this requirement to um, have these background papers available for inspection doesn't count if the documents would disclose quote unquote exempt information. So the question then is, well, what is exempt information? Uh, and now if I could have my next slide, please. Um, there are various um, types of information that fit this description, but the one we're interested in is information relating to the financial and business affairs of a person. So you might assume at first blush, oh, okay, well, that's, that's the end of that then. Well, no, it's not, because that exemption only applies if, and this is the key part, in all the circumstances of the case, the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. Now, previously, the courts had um, taken the approach to that, um, that it wasn't appropriate, generally speaking, for viability evidence to be disclosed in full. Um, well, really on, on precisely that basis, on, com confident, on confidentiality grounds, on the basis that it inclu um, includes commercially sensitive information. 
and there's a line of case law on that which culminated in a case called Perry and I've put the citation there. Um, but what the claimant was arguing in this case is that there'd effectively been a material change of circumstances since then and that public interest in that part of the statute I've just read out to you needs to be approached differently in light of that change. And specifically, what had happened is that the government had changed the policy framework around viability quite significantly. And in particular, paragraph 57 of the MPPF had been introduced, which no doubt you'll be familiar with it, but it says that viability assessments should be publicly available. And there's also then some more detailed guidance along the same lines in the PPG. Um, next slide, please. So um, that was the position. Those were the arguments being made. What did the court decide? Um, well, the court thought that one of the key issues before the decision maker, before the local authority, was whether viability concerns justified the non-policy compliant um, affordable housing offer. So in other words, whether it was OK for the developer simply to, to make the offsite contribution. And given that that was the key issue, the judge conclu concluded that at least some of the undisclosed viability evidence contained important facts or matters on, what, on which the report recommending the grant of planning permission was based. And so therefore we were brought within this category of section 100D um, and on the face of it, these background papers, or at least some of them, a list of them had to be provided and they had to be made available. So the question was then, but does the exempt information exception apply? And the court concluded in light of the changes to the policy framework that I just mentioned, that this exemption did not apply. And I've set out a really key um, quote from the judgment there, and I'll just read out the underlined bit. The interests which placing viability assessments into the public domain serve are clearly public interests, which in my view support the contention that such assessments are not exempt information unless the exceptional um, circumstances spoken to the PPG arise uh, and a solely executive summary should be put in the public domain. So um, there was a breach of the terms of section 100D. The court then had to consider, could I have my next slide please, whether that breach was material. So for the non-lawyers, really that means, did this breach of the statute actually matter? So the council was arguing that even if technically there'd been a breach, it didn't really matter to the substance because there was enough viability evidence that had been disclosed by way of the initial uh, redacted report and then the summary, which meant that um, the claimant, Hoban Studios, had enough information to be able to make meaningful representations on viability and on this affordable housing issue. Um, the court rejected that argument pretty categorically uh, and really, in a nutshell, because the um, viability evidence that, that was um, disclosed to the public was of such poor quality. And in particular, the court referred to inconsistencies in the material that had been disclosed and which couldn't be explained from the material that the public had. Um, so just to give some of the main examples, there were different figures given within the documentation as to what the benchmark land value was. There was no explanation of how the benchmark land value had been calculated. And that's very much contrary to the approach um, that the PPG requires. It wasn't broken down into what part one was the existing use value and then part two, the landowner's premium. Um, and indeed, the material available seemed to indicate that actually the wrong calculation method had been used. 
um, the old residual land value method rather than the existing use value, which is now what government guidance says has to be um, applied. So um, drawing that all together, the court, you can see, was not very impressed by this evidence and they concluded, well, the judge concluded that the material in the public domain was incons inconsistent and opaque. And so on that basis, there'd been a breach of section 100D. Uh, it was a material breach, it mattered, uh, and the planning commission was quashed. So um, turning then um, to my final slide, uh, which is some key takeaways. And as I say, Richard will add to these. Um, but I, th I think the starting point has got to be in light of the latest guidance, so um, the MPPF, the PPG, and now this decision in Hoban Studios, the starting point is that um, at least the primary viability evidence um, will have to be disclosed to the public in an unredacted form. And I would suggest that um, anyone preparing viability evidence or thinking about what needs to be disclosed should start with the expectation that everything will need to be disclosed in full. Um, and actually, it's interesting speaking to Matt about this just briefly before we started. He said that following this decision, that's definitely the approach that he is taking. So in other words, it, sh it should be a surprise if something is not disclosed. You should assume that it is all going to be disclosed. Now, um, there may in particular cases be a justification for non-disclosure. Um, and you need to think very carefully about your particular scenario. Um, and you will need to show uh, if you want to go down this route, that there is particular information which is genuinely commercially sensitive. And I'd suggest that you need to be really um, intellectually rigorous and honest when you um, undertake that exercise, because the guidance now makes it clear that um, almost everything in most viability assessments is not going to be commercially sensitive because it's not specific to a specific developer. If, if there's a particular patch of land that's going to be developed, um, the viability inputs in developing that are the same if I were to, to develop it, if you were going to develop it, or if the developer down the street were going to develop it. There's no need for there to be any commercially sensitive information included in most viability assessments. Um, there may be some cases where there is an exception to that, uh, and the PPG gives some examples. It says um, exceptional circumstances, such as ongoing negotiations about land purchase, and information relating to compensation that may be due to individuals such as right to light compensation. So you can see there those particular inputs are specific to a particular developer and, and are commercially sensitive. Uh, and But even where that applies, it's not the case that you just um, <laughs> don't uh, or block out the entire viability assessment, you need to identify really carefully what the commercially sensitive element is. And then what the PPG says that you do is to produce a summary, an executive summary of that particular information. And the PPG is quite specific as to how you go about doing that. So that effectively, the general principle is that you're disclosing as much as you possibly can and that the absolute minimum is um, kept from the public and that when the public looks at the picture overall, OK, there might be a couple of small elements that haven't been included, but they can understand the broad viability exercise that has been undertaken and what the key inputs are. Um, so as I've said, then it would be a case of publishing um, a summary which has got to comply with the PPG. The other important point to make about this, and one of the reasons that um, Hackney fell down in the Hoban Studios case, is that um, you can't do these things with hindsight, and particularly not um, to turn up in court and say that you've done them. 
if um, these sorts of decisions are going to be made about particular limited information that's not going to be disclosed, there needs to be very clear decision making, um, particularly by the local authority as to what has been decided and why, with reasons. So if the information has been commercial, deemed commercially sensitive, why? There needs to be a contemporaneous document which explains that. Um, the um, public interest exception. Um, why is it that the commercial interest, when weighed against the um, public interest um, element, comes up, um, comes up trumps? Um, that may be a legitimate conclusion to reach, but that needs to be thought about at the time a decision made and reasons given. Um, my next um, point I've sort of touched on, but the viability, this is then about the, the format of the viability evidence and its quality. It needs to identify really clearly the various inputs, the key figures, and explain how they were calculated. Um, so, for example, benchmark land value. It needs to give clearly what that figure is and then a breakdown as briefly as possible how it was arrived at. Um, and then I've said um, to prepare viability evidence on the basis that an educated member of the public should be able to follow it. Um, I think that's a really good general principle. Um, both for the experts um, who prepare these reports, but also for decision makers, whether it's um, me as a lawyer or, or a planning officer in a local authority, um, whoever it may be. Um, I am not by any means um, a viability expert. I'm not somebody like Matt, but when I get a report, if I don't understand it, um, alarm bells should ring. Um, okay, it's a difficult concept and I probably need to concentrate quite hard to understand it and get to the bottom of, of it. But if ultimately I can't or I'm really struggling, and this will apply to pretty much everybody listening, um, raise it, raise that early. Um, and in all likelihood, um, that is not because um, you have you know, you're unintelligent or you're failing to understand or apply yourself, it's because the report has not been written clearly enough. Uh, and if you can't understand it, then um, decision makers probably can't understand it. And a high court judge is unlikely to understand it. And even if he or she can, they're unlikely to be impressed by it. So um, that's a good test to apply. And then I've just said at the end, remember, remember clever people make difficult concepts sound simple. Um, in my experience, that is generally true. It is a real art to be able to explain something complicated, difficult and technical in a way that is accessible and makes it sound straightforward. So if a viability report is easy to understand and makes the viability assessment um, seem simple, that is because in all likelihood, the person who's written that report is a really skillful um, professional. And so that is what they should be aiming at. May seem a bit counterintuitive, but rather than making it seem more complicated and difficult, uh, if they've made something so difficult uh, come across as relatively straightforward, um, then they should be commended for doing so. And that's what um, they should be aiming for. Um, so I think that's all I have to say uh, for now. I will pass over to Richard, who no doubt will have some interesting things to add. Uh, Catherine, th thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to sort of chip in, chip in a few thoughts on, vi on viability and perspective of the issues we had in Holborn and also which have come up in a number of cases. And John, if you want to move on to the next slide, please. Um, just as an example of where viability or the equivalent process of looking at development appraisals comes up, yes, in terms of setting community infrastructure levy, uh, establishing policies which rely on a viability assessment, handling of applications, dealing with affordable housing and 106s, enabling development in the context of heritage schemes, development in the ground solicited buildings and the like. But also it comes up in 
uh, dealing with compulsory purchase orders, which are reliant on a commercial developer carrying out the scheme. So is it a viable project to proceed with? And uh, it will arise in the context of looking at bond appraisal in the context of land compensation for compulsory purchase, both in terms of valuing and also in terms of the likelihood of something happening. And that goes into negotiation of damages as well. Um, viability has also been raised where a regulator has to look forward. So um, the, the Thornton and Oil and Gas Authority, uh, the regulator needed to have regard to the ability of somebody who was going to have the benefit of a petroleum license to meet the decommissioning costs of the onshore wells in due course. So a number of different contexts, several of which actually show quite sort of close consideration of it by the court. But if we move on to the next slide, um, I wanted to sort of pick up on a couple of the lessons from the documents in Holborn Studios, uh, because the court established it needed to be made available. Second question, is, as Catherine identified, was does it, did it matter? And why did it matter that various things had to be produced? Um, one is simply the question of understanding what the available documents were saying. So the development appraisal which was put in referred to residualized price, which suggests that the appraisal calculated that. And when we came to the permission hearing in the High Court in front of Mrs. Justice Leven, or Natalie Leven, um, as was, um, she said um, to, to the submission from the council, this actually that was the benchmark figure that had been slotted in as a benchmark figure. How could any of the reader, any reader of the documents know that? Um, and she was also, and in that was the judge in the substantive hearing later on, saying these documents don't, the published documents don't make sense. And um, Mrs. Justice Lieber made the point as a formerly experienced planning barrister, um, that if she couldn't understand uh, the figures, uh, she didn't know how any even well-informed member of the public could be expected to do so. So can you actually understand what it is? Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, related question, I suppose, is does the council understand uh, the figures which it's uh, been given? And in Holborn Studios, the affordable housing figure had been, the offer had been changed with no explanation discernible from the papers. There are a number of different figures that were floating around for benchmark figures, one of which was introduced in an update report handed in uh, shortly after the committee meeting had started. And the council's explanation both at committee and then in subsequent evidence um, was different and inconsistent with the documents. So um, you need to make sure that from the council that you, you do understand it. And from the developer perspective, that you're putting forward figures which the council officers or their consultants are able to understand and able uh, to explain. Some of the photos I'm putting up, by the way, are taken at um, Holborn Studios as part of the portfolio which they have. Um, moving on to the next one, please. Um, missing material, which was a problem in Holborn Studios, things that weren't expected, how the landmark land value, with benchmark landmark value was made up, wasn't disclosed. The later explanation which produced in a witness statement, which didn't have accompanying documents, uh, that gave two bases it was worked for existing use value. One said to be the value of the current lease and the other, the value of the site with a potential future commercial um, lease. Now, as the current lessees, Holborn Studios potentially had quite a lot to say uh, on those topics about what value you put on the current lease in terms of effective break clauses and the like. And also the uh, higher, the sort of occupier of the Holborn Studios scenario generated a significantly higher existing use value, it was said. Um, but that was all based on, one might say, sort of building up the attractiveness of the current facilities. Whereas the developer had put in um, employment assessments, which were designed to demonstrate that the current facilities were not commercially very attractive. So there is a danger, particularly of undisclosed documents, 
um, being used in ways inconsistent with the overall uh, position. Uh, ne next one, please. So looking um, more, more generally, um, what sort of things to be looking at and thinking about? Uh, the judgments about what the development value um, should be, can be um, difficult. It's a value, particularly valuing properties in the future. And there are some cases, uh, one I've seen relatively recently, where the uh, house price, which properties were subsequently marketed for, uh, was very considerably greater uh, than the figure that we should have been using the development appraisal now. There may be a very good explanation for that, um, but uh, I think there is a, a case for a bit of, bit, of, bit of looking back at some development appraisals just to see uh, whether the projections they put in were right, and that could be a learning experience all round. Uh, build costs, to an extent, um, uh, generic, but often going to be obviously site specific, question how far you need to get into those. And the role of expert advice is uh, going to be quite critical uh, in that. But again, picking up one of Catherine's points, um, quite often problems with development appraisal can be worked out by somebody who's moderately well informed, just working hard, trying to understand where the figures uh, have come from. And uh, land acquisition values, I picked up on some of the problems um, which, which are generated. Uh, on those assessments, and I think particularly the need for consistency in how you look at it. Uh, next, I want to pick up on a couple of uh, cases and issues. So, John, a recent um, Lands Chamber decision, which was looking at compensation for compulsory acquisition of an amusement arcade, um, gave a, a bit of a warning against an, perhaps inappropriate use of some of the residential development appraisal software has been a bit too sophisticated and also uh, in the tribunal's views leaving out much of the essential detail leave much of the essential detail obscured from view now, i think they ultimately they got to the bottom of what that material was um, but do look even if you're using standard software um, at whether somebody is capable of properly understanding uh, how things have been worked out uh, next one please um, a scottish case um, which is in context of a damages claim um, under a, a servitude, so effect essentially a way leave. Uh, losses caused by a pipeline through property, oil pipeline might go bang, um, and that it said prevented a five star hotel development uh, on the site. The court dismissed the claim. There was a serious problems in the evidence as to what it was, the valuation purpose in particular, were being assessed, which was inconsistent with various planning schemes and the like. So there's often a problem, a need for clarity uh, of, of what is being dealt with. And the court ultimately found that what was proposed was unbuildable and going to be unviable. So the damages claim failed. And it's a good illustration of how some of these things are, are picked up. Uh, I think my final slide next, John, um, um, going back to a CPO case, it's a relatively old case sort of uh, about 14 or 15 years ago, but uh, it's concerned a compulsory purchase in Brickhouse in uh, West Yorkshire for uh, a retail scheme on a, a central site. One of the issues was the viability of the scheme. Was there a likelihood that the scheme would proceed if the order was confirmed? And given it was developer funded, that went to viability. Our uh, viability was Tudor development appraisals were put in from both sides, uh, assessed and heavily cross examined on. And the developers' uh, profit figure in their own evidence fell from 12% to the, the close of uh, cross examination, 3.7%, uh, which the developers, the acquiring authorities, witness accepted, made the scheme unviable, and um, he accepted that a developer would be bonkers uh, to proceed with the scheme. So the Secretary refused to confirm the order on viability grounds. Uh, and it's an illustration of um, the, the need to get these as right as they can be, and the way in which on detailed analysis, um, things can, can fall apart. 
So if you're preparing them, trying to find ways of uh, avoiding that happening. Uh, so those are a couple of, couple of thoughts um, from me. Um, I think what we'll do then, hand back to John and see if we can, can do a couple of questions. Thank you very much all. Thank you, especially uh, Matt um, and Richard for those insights. Catherine, it was a pleasure as always to hear your practical common sense approach to a case like Hoven Studios, a bit like the judge as well. So turning to questions, we, we've had one on Hoven Studios um, already this afternoon uh, about the extent to which, um, as it were, the, the honest developer disclosing his report, willing to sign up to a section 106 that's policy compliant, needs to basically go through the Hoban, as it were, ringer or fine sieve. Um, thoughts, please. Um, shall, shall, I, shall I kick off? I think, to go first, Richard. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, vi viability matters on a planning application if you're looking for an excuse for non-policy compliant development, really. Mm -hmm. That's if you're not providing the affordable housing, if you're finding enabling development. I know there's a desire also for something of a, of a benchmark, um, but um, if you're gonna avoid having to do development viability appraisal, um, that's probably the best um, way of, of, of um, dealing with it. Um, so that, that's the sort of that's my, my quick thought on that question. Thank you very much. Matt, anything you'd like to say from the surveyor's perspective? I, I don't think so, to be honest on that one, John. I think we've, I think we've, we've covered it through the presentation, haven't we, in, in some quite significant detail, unless Catherine wants to elaborate on, on anything from, from a legal perspective uh, in that respect. Well, can I ask you a practical question, Matt? Yes, of course you can, absolutely. Um, as, Ka as Catherine made mention, um, if I can characterize it this way, um, the approach since Hoban is, I wouldn't quite say honesty first, but certainly to err on the more generous side. Uh, what's prompted that? Bear in mind, as it were, the um, commercial imperatives uh, that sometimes are placed upon you as to what you have to dispose and what you should dispose, as it were, and what you may dispose. Well, I think it's I think the Hoban case has obviously given rise to quite significant commercial risk. So it's it's evident that if the if the applicant or appealant uh, in those circumstances hasn't disclosed the full information and made it very clear and understandable to the local authority and to other stakeholders, wider stakeholders, that there's a significant risk of um, firstly, there's presumably a risk of refusal, but then quite clearly there's a risk downstream of legal challenge, which will increase commercial risk, cost, and therefore I think there's a sensible set of decisions that have been made, in, in my experience, by clients, so developers um, and, and landowners, in disclosing information so such forth that they are at limited or lower risk and mitigating that risk of challenge going forward. And, and I think that there's Hoban, but then obviously there's PPG as well, which advises transparency, drawing down from the NPPF as well. Yeah. Now, applying the Barnes test, if I can call it that, of if it's readable to me, then it should be readable to a member of the public, but, but in, all, in all sorts, making something user-friendly. I mean, what experience have you had of that? Because I, I have to say, reading some reports, um, they're, they're long on the software and the outputs, but short on the explanation, as though somehow the reader has a pre-knowledge of the finer points. Yes, I think that's probably a fair point. Um, there's a, I think, a long-standing um, perception that um, viability assessments are written by surveyors for surveyors, um, which obviously isn't isn't actually the case. Um, and that's, I think, probably partly taken from um, you know, the, the the way that it's drawn through from valuation. That it's again a valuation written for a value or for, for financing purposes for, for mm. that are familiar with the terms. What, what I'm increasingly seeing um, and what, what I'm trying to do is to at least include up front an executive summary, which obviously ties back to PPG, which is very clear and sets out the assumptions so that, so that somebody can work through 
literally within one to two pages, all of the key assumptions that are included within a viability assessment. And, and they have those financial figures. Then within the report itself, there should be sufficient explanation around each of the input assumptions that are applied within the appraisal, such that it's easy for a, a reader to cross-reference against the, the actual financial appraisal that's, that should be appended uh, to, to the document as well. So I think the idea is that the, the level of ease of, for the reader is increased, um, firstly through clarity up front in terms of the actual inputs and the output, and then a greater degree of explanation. And then there should be, of course, supporting comparable or, or um, calculated uh, valuation evidence to support the assumptions that have been included as well. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Well, we're nearing the end of our time, but I think, Richard, there are a couple of questions that have just come in, um, which you perhaps would like to tackle. Okay, I, I try and go through and see what we... Um, first of all, a question really about whether the, um, the suggestion that the viability appraisal might agree a benchmark value, say 5 million, market price actually paid um, might be 10 million, the possibility to develop a running effectively two sets of, sets of books for that reason. I think, I think the, the reason why we were into sort of benchmark values is to try and avoid a situation um, whereby the market is pricing development land uh, in a non-policy compliant sense, uh, that the, the, the land is being priced on the assumption that it won't provide the affordable housing which is required by policy. Um, and the, the aim with the benchmark land value and EUV plus is to try and sort of force down um, that, that, that position to avoid the point and um, Mr. Justice Holgate makes a point in Parkhurst. There's his mm. judgment there. You, you just read the homily at the end is the best bit to have a look at. Um, that if, if you put in prices which are paid, which assume that development is going to be non-policy compliant, you're never going to get the affordable housing that policy is, is expecting. Um, so the, the, it, it ought to start sort of equating, and the planning system will say it's a bit tough if people have overpaid on that. Um, I just move quickly on to the second question yeah. and made lobby, um, which is um, uh, just a premium on existing use value of brownfield. Somebody suggested their experience, generally speaking, order of 10 to 30 percent. What premium is allowed on EUV for agricultural land? I mean, my I, Matt's probably far better qualified than me to, to, to say, but I, I quickly venture the suggestion that on the big strategic sites um, in the southern part of England on Greenfield site, you, you, you may be looking at £250,000 an acre. So essentially, so 10 times yeah. agricultural land value, which actually is what the Let Wind Review suggested might be a good benchmark. But Matt will have a far better answer than I have. Yes, I, th I think I think you might have mentioned meant that. Sorry, Richard, two hundred and fifty thousand pounds per hectare was that, or hundred? Yeah, sorry per hectare. Yeah, yeah, that'll be a lot per acre. <laughs> Very so, bad. Yeah, sorry. Well, um, I think I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree with Richard there. I think we tend to see hundred thousand pounds per acre as being the sort of the minimum level to release greenfield strategic sites, um, which is based on you know, the minimum levels in option agreements. The, the, that's fine on larger scale sites that have got you know, significant gross areas of development and the net developable area is say you know, 50, 60% of the gross, but, and, and have potentially have large areas of strategic infrastructure requirements and other costs. But actually when you would get to smaller sites that perhaps have a, have a, a greater level of developable land and a, and, and a lower burden, then you would expect that, that value to increase. I think one of the issues that we're seeing at the moment is there seems to be this drive towards £100,000 per gross acre on all sizes of sites through the local plan process, still viability testing. Yeah. My concern with that is that that's going to cause an issue in respect of the reality of landowners' expectations and, and, and the burdens that are placed on that land um, and, and there being a bit of a, a conflict between the two. So that... In my view, there should be a view to, to also cross-check against market evidence, which PPD, PPG does recommend. I think that should be quite a strong cross-check and there should be a view of um, transactions of greenfield sites, uh, but where those are not policy compliant, they should be reweighted 
to ensure they are policy compliant and there should be a general reweighting across location, value and other, and other cost factors to ensure that there's a consistency. That would mean that you could come produce a comparable set of, of transactions which would cross-check cross -check the benchmark land value on a like-for-like -like basis. My concern at the moment is there's a, there's a bit of a, a very simplistic approach being taken in some cases just to revert to £100,000 per gross acre, which is just misrepresentative of yeah. certainly small and medium-sized greenfield sites. Yeah, uh, that's very helpful. Thank you very much, Matt. Well, we're nearly out of time, but there is uh, a question that's coming on local plan viability and really how much evidence needs to be given um, at that stage, because I know there's been concern about uh, an overly light touch. Equally, giving too much too soon may fix your scheme too early. Any thoughts on that one, um, panel? I'll jump in if... if um, yeah. yeah, OK. Um, I mean, I th think my concern or my, my view in that, in respect of that, is that there has typically and historically been a, a reluctance from developers and land promoters to include viability evidence of the local plan process, within the local plan process, because effectively there's a, a beauty parade situation and nobody wants to be raising any potential issues around viability mm -hmm. at that stage. However, there's obviously an onus on, in the MPPF on local plan policy being deliverable and, and viable. Mm -hmm. Um, and that policy costs shouldn't be set at a level which precludes sites coming forward. Alongside that, there's also needs to be consideration that there'll be an expectation that if an application is submitted, let's say subject to allocation, downstream mm -hmm. for let's say a strategic site, that that site will bring forward the level of affordable housing and other 106 yeah. obligations mm -hmm. consistent with that which was set out in, during the plan making process. So there's a risk that if now, if evidence is not put forward to mm -hmm that if there is a view, a disagreeing view with the level of policy cost that's emerging through the plan process, that developers may leave themselves and landowners in a difficult position yeah. and are trying to argue, actually, they can't meet those costs downstream. So there's a, there's a two-way two process there. I think there needs to be yeah. a greater level of scrutiny at that plan-making process, through that plan-making process at that stage. Developers do have to disclose that information and do have to put down their views and set those out. Admittedly, I know it could be costly and there can be quite a lot of technical unknowns, but it's important that that's set out there and those markers are placed. Because if you don't, then there's going to be quite significant issues potentially downstream if you then have a situation where you can't you can't yeah. deliver the level of policy that you've effectively signed up to. Yeah. Well, and can I just add it there that there's the application of the Barnes test again, because uh, my experience is that local plan inspectors do struggle on issues of viability and certainly uh, the local authority oftentimes is under-resourced in terms of being able to, as it were, present their side of things. So all the more important that um, matters are done in a way that's effective and also communicates the message. Well, we're out of time now. Thank you so much for watching this afternoon. Uh, please do look at our website for continuing um, web, webinars, podcasts, articles, newsletters, and indeed uh, the way in which we can continue to, to serve during uh, this diminishing lockdown. So uh, it leaves me to say good afternoon, thank you for watching, and happy Easter. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.